uh, thank you all for joining us. And we're looking forward to what I would like to do is to say a few words about our distinguished speaker. So maybe all of you know uh, something about Michael Mann, because after all, you're here. He is an extremely eminent uh, earth scientist and has been so for several decades. But uh, from my point of view, one of the most wonderful things is his contribution to the science dialogue concerning climate change and trying to move the needle so that we in our country and in the world uh, can attack the, the very serious problems that we're confronting. So uh, if in the lower right of, your, of this uh, screen share, you see a very famous graph, which is called the hockey stick curve, uh, because at least in some people's view, this rep, the, the curvy line rep, look, resembles a hockey stick. But what exactly is shown here is how the temperature of the earth, the average temperature across the earth has fluctuated over uh, the last thousand years. And uh, uh, Michael Mann and his coworkers published this curve in 1998. Uh, and what it shows is a spectacular increase in temperature over the last uh, few decades preceding the publication of the curve in 1998. Uh, Mike Mann has made many contributions writing books uh, many presentations to, for both the public. And he, uh, this work has been recognized in both the scientific community and in the science education committee community. And as you see from the words at the bottom, he was a recipient of the first Friend of the Planet Award from the National Center for Science Education. And is he, he is co-founder of the climatology blog, Real Climate. So I'm genuinely thrilled to have you hear and share what he has to say tonight. Thank you. Take it, Mike. Uh, thanks again, uh, Milton, um, uh, a, a good friend and a colleague. Um, and, and thanks to all of you here with Extinction Rebellion for the work that you're doing, for the tremendous outreach you're doing when it comes to the crisis of our time, the, the climate crisis, and for inviting me uh, here today for this conversation, which I'm very much looking forward to. Now, I will be talking about what I call the new climate war. It is the, the title of my recent book, uh, and it's about the challenges that we face today um, as we sort of get past denialism. It's just not credible, even for the most hardened contrarians now to argue that climate change isn't happening because we can see it playing out in real time uh, on our television screens this summer in particular, just the profound, unprecedented extreme weather events uh, that were occurring as the next report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, came out. And really, for the first time, the IPCC connected the dots. They stopped hemming and hawing and, and pretty much came out and said, yeah, these unprecedented catastrophes we're seeing, that's because of climate change. So that's where we are. Denial isn't tenable anymore, but the forces of inaction, I call them the inactivists, fossil fuel interests, polluters, and those doing their bidding have turned to an insidious array of alternative tactics um, that stop short of denial, but that still uh, are aimed at preventing us from moving on, from moving away from fossil fuels uh, towards renewable energy. Let me talk a little bit about the projections, and I'm not going to talk about the projections of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the project, uh, pr projections that were made 50 years ago by none other than the scientists at ExxonMobil, the world's largest publicly traded fossil fuel company. Uh, nearly a half century ago, ExxonMobil's own scientists made a remarkable prediction. They successfully predicted where we would be now, the increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide pollution in the atmosphere and the warming that would result from that if we can continued with uh, business as usual. And in fact, they referred to the consequences of that warming. ExxonMobil's own scientists referred to the consequences of that warming as potentially catastrophic. Those weren't Al Gore's words. Those weren't my words. Those weren't the words of the IPCC. Those were the words of ExxonMobil's own scientists. But instead of coming clean with what they had found with their predictions, 
what they portended for the future if we fail to decarbonize society, move away from fossil fuels. As we know, they instead got rid of that division and spent hundreds of millions of dollars in a massive disinformation campaign intended to discredit independent scientists who had come to the same conclusion that their own scientists had secretly come to when it comes to the threat of climate change. And as a result of that, we now have a much uh, tougher, uh, a much tougher uh, sort of, um, you know, task at hand. If we had acted decades ago, we could have gently reduced our carbon emissions, gently moved away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. But because of decades of inaction, uh, bought to a large extent from the disinformation campaign of the fossil fuel interest and those promoting their agenda, we now have a much tougher task at hand. We have to bring those carbon emissions down far more dramatically. You've all heard the numbers, but I'll repeat them. We've got to bring our carbon emissions halfway down that mountain, reduced by 50% within the next decade and down to zero in a matter of a few decades if we are to have any hope of stabilizing warming below, we sometimes say a dangerous one and a half degrees Celsius. Well, look, dangerous climate change has actually arrived. We've been seeing that on our television screens uh, this summer. So at this point, we've already encountered dangerous climate change. The question is how bad are we willing to let it get? And if we let it exceed one and a half degrees Celsius, nearly three degrees Fahrenheit, then we start to see some of the worst and, and, and potentially irreversible impacts of climate change. And again, you don't have to use your imagination anymore to see those impacts. Every summer now, yet again, record heat here in the United States, uh, in Europe, in Asia, around the world heat waves, unprecedented heat waves. The hottest temperature ever reliably recorded um, on the planet, uh, I would have said was last year. That's what I was saying before, uh, but it's actually this year because last year it was 129.9 degrees Fahrenheit in Death Valley. This year, they set a new record, 130.0. Hottest temperature ever reliably recorded on this planet, on this planet. Uh, you may have read just uh, a week or so ago, um, the hottest temperature ever recorded in Europe. So we're seeing history be made, and this isn't good history. This onslaught of record heat waves that are part of this trend, five-fold increase in the frequency and intensity of heat waves in recent decades as the planet warms up. Unprecedented wildfires, you take heat, you combine it with drought, is the mid-latitude regions, Western US, um, uh, the Mediterranean, Southern Europe, the summers get drier, hotter. You put that heat and drought together, you get record wildfires like we've seen in California as the second largest wildfire in California history, by the way, is still burning. But uh, this uh, was uh, an article that I read um, a couple months ago, a few months ago, Washington Post, as we were going into the fire season, California facing drought crisis as water shortages mount and fire danger escalates. And we now know uh, that um, several months later, we have realized the worst fears that we had going into this season. But what was remarkable to me was that, and I've done a screen capture, this is exactly as it appeared on my computer. This was brought to you by ExxonMobil, literally. <laughs> Um, that is the ad banner that appeared with this article. Um, and of course, we know that this was brought to us courtesy of ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel companies. The heat dome, one in a thousand years, one in a 40,000 years by some uh, estimate. Um, what we're doing is we're taking events that we would have called thousand year events that shouldn't happen more often than once in a thousand years or once in 10,000 years and they're becoming annual events. That is how dramatic the change in statistics of these extreme events is as we warm up the planet. Now, I've been talking about the United States, Europe. I spent a sabbatical a year and a half ago down under in Australia as they lived through what they now call the Black Summer. 
Um, it was this summer of unprecedented heat and drought and bushfires that spread out across the continent. And I experienced that. I was there. Um, I didn't plan to be there at that time, but it just so happens I arrived for my sabbatical as that was all playing out. And in my uh, uh, apartment um, in Sydney, uh, I had to keep my windows closed or it would be difficult to breathe from, from all the uh, wildfire smoke that uh, we were experiencing. And it was a tragedy um, in every imaginable way. Um, ancient uh, forests destroyed, um, lives and livelihoods uh, lost. You've probably seen some of the images that came out of the Black Summer. Some of them are seared into our consciousness, this, this image of this kangaroo. Um, uh, it still haunts me. Uh, it's seared uh, into my own consciousness. That was a year and a half ago. Uh, a year later, this was the scene in the same state of Australia, New South Wales. And your eyes aren't deceiving you. That is a house floating down a river. That is what you're watching happen. Unprecedented floods. So we go from unprecedented heat, drought, and wildfires one year to unprecedented flooding the next year. And no, that's not inconsistent. You know, the critics would say, you climate scientists, you have to get your story straight. Is it heat and drought or is it flooding? It's both. The science tells us that we see greater extremes on both sides of the spectrum as we warm up the planet. Some of our own work has fleshed out the details of that. And so, Sometimes these things surprise, uh, combine in surprising ways that we wouldn't have thought about, we wouldn't have worried about until we see them happen. And this is sort of in that category of unwelcome surprises, things that our models didn't really predict, that we didn't really game out. But when we see them happen, we can put two and two together and say, ah, so when you have these dramatic wildfires um, and you destabilize the the topsoil, you kill off the vegetation, you destabilize the, the topsoil. And then the winter storms eventually come and they have more rain in them because the atmosphere is warmer and can hold more moisture. So those winter storms bring larger flooding events. They combine with the denuded soils and, 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 and uh, the, uh, the topsoils that have lost their vegetation and you get these catastrophic mudslides like we see. Um, in California, uh, like we've seen in places like Flagstaff uh, just earlier this summer, like we've seen in Europe, if you've been watching your headlines this summer. So, you know, as I said before, um, you don't have to use your imagination anymore. It's not about polar bears up in the Arctic uh, anymore. It's about us, um, our lives, and how they are being increasingly turned upside down by these catastrophic climate change consequences. This is the face of climate change. We've come face to face with it. Uh, this was an article that ran in The Guardian um, just, uh, uh, what was it, uh, a month ago or so. I'm quoted there, um, but the headline is what I want you. This is the front page of The Guardian. Nowhere is safe. Warning on escalating climate crisis, the latest IPCC report, which comes as close as you will ever see to scientists tolling on, uh, you know, climbing to the top of the tallest buildings, screaming at the top of their lungs, because that's now what we're seeing. We're seeing the IPCC, this very conservative scientific body, really describe things in quite strident and stark terms. That's what we've reached. Dangerous climate change is here. It's a matter at this point uh, of how bad we're willing to let it get. And hey, it's even hurting the fossil fuel industry. Power companies, you know, fossil fuel power companies are now dealing with the devastating consequences of climate change. Uh, according to this article in the New York Times uh, that appeared um, about a month ago, uh, there's a certain amount of irony in that. Um, it's come back to bite them now their own practices, their own delay, their own denial. And as I said, this latest IPCC report really connected the dots at a time when we were watching these catastrophic extreme weather events here in the United States, in the Western US, in Europe, um, in Japan, in China, 
it all sort of came together, if you'll forgive the expression, in a perfect storm that I think has crystallized um, the, the crisis that we face. As I said, you know, there are zero years left to avoid dangerous climate change. Uh, I was asked, how, how much time is left? Zero, <laughs> because it's here. The, the, at this point, it's a matter of, of limiting the damage. We've already encountered damage and, and, and a certain amount is baked in, a certain amount is unavoidable. We can prevent truly catastrophic global scale consequences if we still act. But that window, as we'll see, as we've already seen, is, is getting very short. Is, we've already seen what one degree does. Um, you know, imagine what four or five degrees Celsius, seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit warming of the planet will do. Um, if we fail to act on this crisis, then, you know, one possible future is a dystopian post-apocalyptic Hollywood style um, disaster film. That's one possible future, but it doesn't have to be our future. There's still time, as I'll point out, to avoid that. So, as I said, fossil fuel companies, um, they're paid advocates, um, conservative networks, conservative newspapers, the Murdoch media empire, this ecosystem of climate change, denialism and delayism, um, they can no longer credibly tell their audiences, tell the American people, tell the people of the world that nothing is happening. That message doesn't work. That argument doesn't work anymore, but they haven't given up. They will do everything in their power to keep us addicted to fossil fuels. And so the old climate war, the denial of the science has essentially uh, disappeared. Um, there are some vestiges, and uh, this is from now uh, more than three years ago, more than four years ago. I testified uh, at the time to the House Science Committee, the House of Representatives Science Committee, which was led by Lamar Smith, a Republican from Texas, who was uh, the largest recipient or one of the largest recipients of fossil fuel money in the entire uh, US Congress and used, uh, some would say abused his authority as the chair of the House Science Committee to use that chairmanship and to use that committee as a cudgel to attack climate science, to attack climate scientists, to try to defund climate science at the major science funding organizations. And he held a hearing um, about the uh, you know, so-called uh, scientific method, um, and uh, which does not mean what he thinks it means. Um, and there was more than one uh, Princess Bride reference that I made uh, during the course of my testimony on that day. But I want to pay, uh, play for you uh, one particular segment. I'm speaking to Lamar Smith. Um, about uh, you know the role that he has played and, and the way that he had used his chairmanship uh, to try to attack the science of climate change. Uh, according to an article that came out a few days ago in the journal Science, uh, Chairman Smith was on record at the Heartland Institute. This is a climate change denying Koch brothers funded uh, outlet um, that has a climate change denier conference every year. And uh, Chairman Smith spoke at that conference. Dr. Mann, don't mischaracterize that. Well, let me, let me finish uh, my... No, they do not say that they are deniers, and you should not say that they are either. Well, uh, we, we can have that discussion. I'd be happy to. Let well, me finish my statement. Well, be accurate in your description. Uh, I, I stand by my statement, asking. but can I finish my uh, uh, point? I'd like to reclaim uh, my time. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, he uh, indicated at this conference that he, according to science, and I'm quoting from them, he sees his role on this committee as to a tool to advance his political agenda rather than a forum to examine important issues facing the U.S. research community. As a scientist, I find that deeply disturbing. Uh, Dr. Mann, who said that? Uh, this is according to Science Magazine, uh, one of the most respected um, and, outlets and, when it comes and to science. And who are they quoting? Um, this is the, uh, the author, uh, Jeffrey Mervis, who wrote that article. I, I'd be happy to send to committee the, okay. uh, the article. Uh, that is not known as an objective writer or magazine. Well, it's Science Magazine. Yeah, I, that... <laughs> so there you are in the up is down, black is white world of uh, climate change denialism, Science Magazine, arguably our most um, prestigious science publication in the United States, 
um, is a biased source. And of course, we know that that is part of this larger assault on reason and truth and logic that we've seen really come to a boil um, uh, in recent years. Uh, in some ways, the sort of bad faith attacks assault on climate science that goes back decades, I, I sometimes think of as a, as a localized cancer that we saw early on in the world of climate change, which is now metastasized to infect our entire body politic in this age of uh, alternative facts and truly uh, fake news. Um, but the good news here is that Lamar Smith is no longer the chair of the House Science Committee. Uh, he was replaced, uh, Democrats uh, won the House. He was replaced by uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson, um, a wonderful uh, African-American woman who has a, a background in science um, in uh, nursing and medicine and sort of reclaimed the rightful role of science um, on the Science Committee. And, and denial has waned because it just isn't credible. The old climate war has largely ended. We've seen sort of a death spiral of outright denialism, but we've seen it replaced by what I call the new climate war. And that consists of soft denial. Oh, it, climate change is happening, but it's not that bad. Um, you know, look at, at sea level. And, and if you look at that red circle, this is Bjorn Lumberg, who calls himself the skeptical environmentalist. He's supported by fossil fuel interests where he wears his Greenpeace t-shirt to convince you that he really cares about the environment and then writes op-eds in the Wall Street Journal and various other conservative publications around the world where he downplays uh, the uh, impacts of climate change, where he claims to accept the science, but then he points to that little red circle where he's saying, look, see sea level rise, he, he actually had focused on the segment that's in the red circle. And he showed that and said, look, sea level hasn't risen <laughs> over that little tiny segment. And I'm showing you the full picture of what he was um, taking out of context. And that's the modus operandi, cherry picking, taking results out of context, bad faith misrepresentations of the science that are intended to downplay the seriousness of climate change. And we see many people in that space. Uh, Bjorn Lumberg might be the most prominent of them. Uh, most recently, uh, Stephen Koonin, who uh, Milton, of course, will recognize. Uh, Milton and I are, uh, both have uh, physics backgrounds. Steve Koonin is a physicist um, who claims to have been an Obama physicist because at one point they, they brought him in as a sounding board. They were looking for somebody who was, had a con contrarian views about climate change so they could respond to those sorts of criticisms. So they did invite him in at one point and he's called himself an Obama scientist as he attacks the science of climate change, downplays the seriousness of climate impacts. And of course he's been featured in the Wall Street Journal multiple times. Uh, George Will recently wrote a column in the Washington Post extolling um, Steve uh, Koonin's latest tirades against the seriousness of climate change. Uh, there's climate feedback, which is a, a panel of leading climate scientists who evaluate uh, various articles that appear in the press for their reliability. And um, uh, in this case, uh, this was a Wall Street Journal article promoting uh, Steve Koonin's book. Um, it got as, just about as ne a negative a score as you can get in terms of scientific accuracy, uh, very low on scientific accuracy, extremely biased. It's a panel of objective scientists. Um, so this Obama scientist that you've been hearing about who supposedly doesn't think climate change is a problem, uh, it turns out he's not really an Obama scientist, although he likes to uh, you know, fashion himself as one. Um, it turns out he's a Tucker Carlson scientist because those are the sorts of forums where we see Steve Koonin on Fox News and elsewhere promoting this sort of soft denial. Yes, I accept the science, but hey, let me tell you, it's not a problem. And in so doing, he's not really accepting the science because the science tells us, hey, it really is a problem. So delay, a lot of this soft denial, and you'll see sort of that there is a, a theme here. Uh, all these words will encounter that begin with D. So there's denial and there's soft denial and there's delay. Oh, well, you know, it's not that bad and we can adapt to the changes that are coming, says Marco Rubio to his fellow Floridians, um, I, whom I guess he expects to uh, grow fins and uh, 
skills because that's about the only way that Floridians will be able to adapt to the massive sea level rise that's resulting from the melting of ice sheets. Or Scott Morrison of Arizona, of uh, 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 Australia, this, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, who's also adopted this sort of uh, we can just adapt uh, to the changes that are coming. It's the next step. I, we don't deny that it's happening, but hey, we can just adapt. And by the way, we can continue to burn fossil fuels and warm up the planet. We'll just adapt to the changes that are coming. When in fact, uh, this latest IPCC report makes it very clear that we will pretty quickly exceed our adaptive capacity if we allow the planet to warm up much, uh, much more. There is no amount of adaptation that is going to allow nearly 8 billion and growing people to survive on a planet with diminishing food and water in space um, if we don't act in dramatic fashion. Or geoengineering, we will just engage in other manipulations of our planetary environment. We'll shoot particles, reflective particles into the stratosphere, sulfur dioxide based particles to try to block out the sunlight. Um, here's a special, um, a NOVA special on geoengineering that by the way was sponsored by David H. Koch, uh, uh, one of the two, one of what were the two Koch brothers. Um, he's since uh, passed away. Uh, there's just one Koch brother, uh, Charles Koch left um, uh, among the largest private funders of climate change denialism. And you can sort of see the direction things have moved uh, away from denial towards well, we can adapt or we'll, we'll, we'll engage in other manipulations of the planetary environment. And by the way, we'll continue to burn fossil fuels in the meantime. It's a very convenient way to kick the can down the road and buy time for polluters to continue with business as usual. It's not a mystery why, you know, the former CEO of the world's largest uh, publicly traded fossil fuel company, Rex Tillerson, viewed climate change as an engineering problem, which was an evolution from the previous uh, ExxonMobil chairman, Lee Raymond, who was a climate change denier. Rex Tillerson represented sort of the next uh, generation of uh, anti-leadership on climate uh, at ExxonMobil. It exists, but hey, we can just engineer our way out of the problem. Bill Gates um, has supported uh, geoengineering. Um, and in part, he supports these geoengineering ventures and he actually has a for-profit company um, to implement some of these fairly elaborate and unprecedented and potentially very dangerous interventions. Um, because he downplays the role that renewable energy can play in accomplishing the transition that needs to happen. And if you downplay the role that existing renewable energy can play, it leads you down a riskier path um, where you propose a nuclear energy, um, which has its own obvious, comes with its own liabilities and dangers uh, and geoengineering, uh, which is um, very much laid in uh, in the principle of unintended consequences. If we start messing around with the planet even further at an unprecedented scale in an unprecedented manner, uh, what could possibly go wrong? So uh, I've gently uh, criticized uh, Bill Gates in his latest book. Um, the path forward that he promotes is one that is laden in unnecessary risk, nuclear, geoengineering, because he downplays the role that we know renewable energy can play in accomplishing this transition. So that's delay, soft denial, delay, deflection. And you know the beverage industry did this decades ago, the crying Indian uh, public service announcement that some of you are probably old enough to remember uh, when you were growing up. I was five or six years old, early 1970s when this was playing. And we all thought it was this very empowering ad that was encouraging us to clean up the pollution, the bottle and can litter that it had accumulated um, in our countryside that was polluting our lakes, our rivers, our streams. And it seemed empowering. It seemed like a great message, uh, but we'd all been had. This was actually a PR. And uh, the uh, 
advertisement ended with the admonition, people start pollution, people can stop it. What it actually was, was an ad campaign. Um, it was uh, run through the Ad Council, um, which is a nonprofit, but it was financed by Coca-Cola and the beverage industry. And it was hatched on Madison Avenue by PR, uh, PR people, executives working for the beverage industry. They didn't want to see bottle bills passing that would put a deposit on bottles and cans. It would clean up the problem. It was a systemic solution to this problem, but it would hurt their profits. It would hurt their bottom line. And so instead they engage in a massive campaign to convince the American people that we didn't need bottle bills. And meanwhile, they would attack bottle bills. They show advertisements um, that had bottles and cans in your garage with cockroaches. This is what's gonna happen, sort of scare tactics, um, attacking bottle bills. And at the same time, this ad campaign convincing you that we don't need bottle bills. We just need to be better stewards of the environment. We just need to you know, pick up the bottles and cans. Well, it was very successful. Um, and as a result, we have one of the other two largest global environmental crises that we face today, the global plastic pollution crisis. We can thank in large part the successful deflection campaign by the beverage industry. And the fossil fuel industry has run with that playbook. Um, they have uh, you know, even gotten mainstream outlets like the New York Times to really focus in much of their climate coverage on individual behavior, all, all the things that we can do as individuals to change our diet, to change our uh, lifestyles, um, how we travel, uh, how many kids we have, to make it all about things that we can do that takes the focus off of the need for systemic solutions. Um, carbon pricing, subsidies for renewables, blocking new fossil fuel infrastructure, all things that need to happen that you and I can't make happen. Only our policymakers can make those things happen. So it isn't a mystery why British Petroleum, BP gave us the very first individual carbon footprint calculator back in the early 2000s, because British Petroleum and other fossil fuel companies wanted us so focused on our own individual carbon footprint that we failed to take notice of theirs. And 70% of the carbon pollution comes from just 100 polluters, 100 companies. That's an inconvenient fact for them. They want to make it about us. And others like uh, Elizabeth Warren during uh, the um, presidential campaign uh, I, I thought did a really good job in exposing um, sort of the intellectual bankruptcy of this idea that is just about our hamburgers and our straws um, rather than the need for systemic change policies. So we've got delay, we've got deflection, we've got division. Hey, how about getting us fighting with each other about our individual lifestyle? getting you and me finger pointing who, who has the better, the greater carbon purity. Um, let he with, who is without carbon sin cast the first stone. Um, it's, it's an ingenious uh, approach. It's been used by bad actors um, using social media, bot armies and trolls that are there to get environmental progressives arguing with each other about their lifestyles. Um, get dividing us, so deflecting attention away from systemic solutions, making it about individual behavior, and at the same time, dividing the community of climate advocates so that we don't speak with a unified voice, demanding action, demanding systemic change. It's an ingenious tactic. We know it's happening. We know fossil fuel companies and bad actors like Russia um, who see themselves um, to some extent as gaining from climate change um, and the instability that results from it. And so uh, Russia has um, engaged in very widespread manipulation of social media um, to uh, try to thwart efforts to act on climate. And one of the things that they've tried to do is to divide the climate advocacy community. You also um, sometimes uh, see you know, uh, Michael Moore, uh, progressive icon, filmmaker, almost inconceivable that he would make a 
movie that was seen as an assault on renewable energy, the, the basically the main climate solution that we have at our disposal. And it divided the community. It got climate advocates fighting with each other. Um, here is my, no you know, less a credential to progressive than Michael Moore pointing out um, how renewable energy is gonna destroy the planet. It's no solution. And I don't know why he uh, chose to write this, you know, to, to produce this very misleading film. Um, and it's extremely misleading. And I and other experts have gone through all of the ways that he distorts the numbers and the science to make it sound like renewable energy is worse than fossil fuel energy. This is Michael Moore. Why would Michael Moore do this? I don't know why he did it. What I do know is who was promoting it. Who promoted that film? No environmental groups, no climate advocates that I know of. The Competitive Enterprise Institute sure loved it. They're a Koch brothers funded climate change denying uh, organization. The Heartland Institute, another Koch brothers funded front group that has engaged in uh, assaults on climate science and renewable energy for years. And Breitbart News loved this. Uh, Michael Moore, you know, takes apart the left's green energy scams. What wonderful headlines if you're an inactivist who doesn't want to see climate action. You've got Michael Moore now throwing this bomb into the center of the climate movement, of the environmental movement. And the Murdoch media empire, which has been the by far the most widespread promoter of climate change denialism on the planet, just loved this, loved the narrative of eco leftists are turning on Michael Moore. Related to this, painting some of our opinion leaders and uh, some of our um, you know, most influential uh, climate advocates like John Kerry, who's the special envoy on climate for the United States, painting them as hypocrites because, hey, they still use air travel. Um, again, it's brilliant, right? It deflects attention away from the real solutions, which are policy, which John Kerry is working towards, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to restore diplomacy, international diplomacy, getting other uh, countries now to join us in the effort to uh, put forward bold reductions pledges. That's a real solution. But hey, let's make it about John Kerry's own personal lifestyle and the fact that he flies on planes will deflect attention away from the systemic, the, you know, the, the discussion, the conversation about systemic solutions. We will um, divide again the community and we discredit an, a, a key advocate. We discredit John Kerry by painting him as a hypocrite. It's a threefer. It plays to at least three different new climate war tactics at the same time. I'm going to start to wrap it up here. Um, and so we see the Murdoch media. They just love this, uh, you know, the, these attacks on John Kerry because he flies um, in, a, in a system where air travel, you know, still does require the use of fossil fuels. You can be working to change the system and still operate within that system. Most of us do that. And we recognize that. There's no inconsistency there. The inconsistency would be if he wasn't arguing for changes in the incentive structure that will determine you know, how we move around, how we live. And then there's doomism. That's the last of the D words. We had deflection, division. We had uh, denial, of course, delay. And now we've got doomism. And what do I mean by that? Well, there are some who have tried to convince us that it's too late to do anything, that all life on earth will be you know, will be gone in 10 years. Um, and that, by the way, I believe was uh, five years ago is when Guy McPherson, so mark it on your calendar. We've got five years left, apparently. We'll all be dead because of what he calls exponential climate change. And there's nothing we can do about it. If you really believe there's nothing we can do about it, that potentially leads you down the same path of disengagement and inaction as outright denial. And Believe me, the inactivists, the polluters and those promoting their agenda, they don't care about the path you take. They just care about the des destination. They want you disengaged. 
And whether it's because you think it's too late to do anything about it, or you don't think the problem exists, doesn't really matter to them. Uh, it's a huge win for them because doom mongering, despair mongering, when that leads to disengagement, is leading to disengagement among the very people who would most likely be on the front lines, progressives, people who care about the environment, who would be out there demanding action, demanding change, if they weren't led to disengage because of despair and, and, uh, and the belief that there's nothing that can be done. Uh, the best you can do is, is move up to the Arctic and live off the grid. And there's a movement that basically says that's what you need to do and adapt to that because it's too late to do anything about it. That's not helpful either. So what does it take to win this war? Well, you know, it's no secret. Conveying urgency, dangerous climate change has arrived. How bad are we willing to let it get? An agency, we can prevent it from getting worse. This, you know, the urgency is obvious. Uh, COVID-19, as deadly as it was, climate change is a far deadlier crisis in the long term. Climate change is a far greater crisis than COVID-19. And that crisis is increasing with each ton of carbon we put into the atmosphere. So there's great urgency in acting. Climate change denial is deadly, just like COVID denial is deadly. And the solution is there. We don't need a miracle, Bill Gates. He's actually said that. Bill Gates has said, we need a miracle as if we need magic new technology that doesn't exist yet. That's very helpful to polluters, this idea that we need to wait a decade and then we'll have the technology to decarbonize our economy. Trust us, we'll solve this problem. So let us continue to burn fossil fuels now and profit from it. Um, again, kicking the can down the road and we can't afford to go any farther down the road. The solutions here, uh, people like Mark Jacobson, their teams, from you know, Stanford, from uh, UC Berkeley, independent teams that have now demonstrated that we have the technology to decarbonize our economy, to, to, um, you know, to get us 80% off of fossil fuels uh, by 2030 and 100% by 2050. We can do this with existing technology. We don't need a miracle. We don't need to invent uh, new technologies. Now, we may find new efficiencies and new technologies that will make the task even easier. But in the meantime, we have what's necessary to decarbonize our economy. The limitations aren't technology, they are political will. And that's really important. It's too often lost in these conversations. And by the way, renewable energy is already cheaper on a levelized cost basis than fossil fuel energy and certainly nuclear as well. The problem is our incentive structure. We're providing subsidies, direct and indirect, to fossil fuels. We're actually giving them a boost. Um, the government has to give them a boost because they wouldn't be competitive in the free market against renewable energy. So our incentives are precisely the opposite of what they need to be. And that's why we need systemic change. And that's why we need policies that will accelerate this transition that's already underway. So that's the good news. The transition is underway. We are moving away from fossil fuels because something better has come along. Renewable energy, the wind and solar boom is here, said the New York Times earlier this year. And it's absolutely true. And we've really seen a turning point uh, over the past few years. We've seen carbon emissions now plateau because of the slow but steady decarbonization of our economy. They're no longer increasing. And the Conservative uh, International Energy Agency said that that's because of the move towards renewable energy. We can already see the effect in decarbonizing the power sector globally, for example. Now, last year, of course, we had a huge drop, 7% global carbon emissions. Most of that was due to the pandemic, the social distancing, the economic slowdown, the lockdowns, all of that slowdown in the global economy led to a, a drop in global carbon emissions but they haven't come back that full 7%. They've come back about 5%. So there's still a net reduction. And what that tells us is, yeah, a lot of those lifestyle changes that were temporary only bought us a temporary decrease in carbon emissions. If we want a permanent decrease in carbon emissions, and by the way, we need a 7% drop every year for each of the years of the next decade, if we are to achieve a reduction by 50% of our carbon emissions 
by 2030 to get us on that path to limiting warming below one and a half Celsius, three degrees Fahrenheit. So we need that 7% year after year, and we're not gonna get that from you know, uh, temporary individual lifestyle changes. We understand that. We need structural change in our global energy economy if we're to get there. And you know, the very conservative um, International Energy Agency, they've been pretty bearish on renewables. They've always underestimated the rate at which renewable energy would penetrate the market. The renewable energy has always greatly exceeded the projections of the International Energy Agency. They have not been you know, um, cheerleaders for renewable energy, but they've said that it is still doable. We can still reduce carbon emissions fast enough to avoid catastrophic warming, but there can be no new oil, gas, or coal development. There can be no new fossil fuel infrastructure. Now, 10 years from now, now, there can be no new fossil fuel infrastructure um, if we are to be on a path that is consistent with keeping warming below catastrophic levels. And that requires, obviously, global re-engagement. Again, a little bit of good news. The United States no longer is a president who denies climate change, uh, dismisses it as a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese, but is once again leading on the world stage. The United States has reasserted leadership. We've made a bold pledge to bring our carbon emissions down by a factor of 50% by 2030. Remember, that's what we need to do globally to avert catastrophic warming of the planet. And that pledge put the US firmly on the side of committing to do that. Now there's still an implementation gap, as we say. It's one thing for politicians to pledge to do something. It's something else to put in place policies that can get us there. And right now there's only so much the administration can do. And they've done pretty much everything they can do in terms of executive actions. But if we're to make good on that sort of pledge, we're gonna to need to codify these efforts in the form of legislation. And all eyes right now, as you probably know, are on this reconciliation package, because that this $3.5 trillion reconciliation package has within it a number of very significant climate measures, one of which is a, a clean energy standard that would require utilities to meet 80% of electricity demand by 2030 from renewables. So that has real teeth in it, but we've got to get that through Congress. And a president can't do that alone. We all have to be out there pushing our own politicians, our own local and state level politicians um, to, to support keeping meaningful climate action in this reconciliation package. It's critical. And there've been some successes, you know, we've seen them in, in a two week period um, in late May and early June, we saw the G7 countries, the world's largest industrial powers agree to stop support for coal production. Now we need to see them stopping support for all fossil fuels infrastructure. So that doesn't, doesn't go far enough, but it's a step in the right direction. That same two week period, uh, a court ordered uh, Royal Dutch Shell, Shell Oil has to reduce their carbon emissions by 45% by 2030. That means they've got to change their whole business plan. They've got to move away dramatically from fossil fuels towards clean energy. And you may have read this headline, Exxon Mobil, um, three, or I think ultimately it was four um, climate advocates got onto the board uh, of um, directors of Exxon Mobil. And that has huge implications now for what their policies are gonna be in the years ahead. And that was because of activism. Uh, actually it was uh, three, three seats, but it's enough seats on the board to fundamentally change the direction that ExxonMobil will be going. Again, the world's largest publicly traded fossil fuel company. Keystone XL pipeline, as you may know, was abandoned by the developer. They couldn't even get um, investors now. And so even the business world and the world of finance, we don't always think of them as environmental allies, but they are starting to become allies um, in this battle. And then last, but certainly not least, um, to me, what gives me the inspiration and the belief that we can do this is this resurgence of global activism and uh, um, you know, uh, Extinction Rebellion is absolutely part of that. The youth climate movement, Greta Thunberg, absolutely part of that. Recentering re the conversation where it always needed to be. For too long, we allowed it to be about science or economics or politics, 
But this is really about ethics. It's about our ethical obligation not to destroy this planet for future generations, our ethical obligation um, to make sure that those who had the least role in creating the problem, the global south, um, the, the developing world, and they'll see the worst impacts of climate change, um, both because in large part they're in tropical regions that are seeing some of the worst impacts on agriculture, extreme weather, hurricanes, but also uh, because they have the least resilience, the least wealth to, um, to, to, to uh, deal, to adapt to the changes that are coming. So th this is more than anything else, it's an ethical and moral obligation on our part, um, given that those who had the least role in creating this problem, both today around the world and when it comes to future generations, are going to see the worst impacts. That is fundamentally unethical uh, for us to go down that path. Okay, and this is this is my daughter, the polar bear. We were at the Pittsburgh Zoo some years ago. It's to me, it's about what sort of world uh, I want to leave behind for my daughter, for her children, for her grandchildren. Um, and you know, is it a world with no Great Barrier Reef, no coral reefs? The coral reefs of the world are gone. The polar bears no longer thrive in the Arctic. And those are just symbolic, right, of a fundamentally degraded planet that we will leave them if we continue down this road. As I've tried to convince you, that's one possible future, but it doesn't have to be our future. There's, there's still time to make sure that we don't end up writing the Great Barrier Reef's obituary, which was written sort of half in jest um, in The Guardian, but it was to make a point this could be a headline that we would see in a matter of a decade or two if we continue down this road. We can still make sure that that's not our future, that we still leave behind a thriving planet for future generations. But the window of opportunity is shrinking. This is our time. We have to act now. It is on all of us. And I will leave you with that message. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, that was a such a stimulating and challenging presentation, Mike. Thanks. Thanks so much for doing it. Thank you. Um, Dan Johnson asked this, are the climate models accurately predicting the changes that are coming quickly? Yeah, so it's a great question, Dan. And um, the answer is sort of, um, it's a bit muddled. When it comes to the warming of the planet, the, the models have basically got it right. So the models have projected pretty accurately how much warming of the planet we would expect at this point, given the carbon pollution we put into the atmosphere. That's the good news. Um, we're, we're not ahead of schedule. Um, it's not worse than the models predicted when it comes to the overall warming. And many of the impacts are tied to the warming of the surface of the planet. The bad news is that some key impacts do appear to be playing out faster. Um, and we sort of understand why the models you know, our approximations, they're often missing processes that we know are important in the real world. Um, that often leads the models to be less dynamic than the real world. When you leave some of those processes out, you realize that ice sheets can start to uh, disintegrate faster than the models predicted because they form cracks and the meltwater penetrates to the bottom of those cracks and lubricates the base of the ice sheet and allows large, pieces of ice to calve out into the ocean. That's a dynamical effect that wasn't in the climate models or the buttressing effect of ice shelves. When the ice shelves collapse, they don't contribute to sea level rise because they're floating on the ocean in the first place. But the ice sheet inland loses the support that that ice shelf was providing like a flying buttress of medieval architecture. The ice shelf disintegrates, the ice now starts to surge out to the ocean. These are some some, some processes that weren't in the ice sheet models. And when we put them into the models, we find, well, the ice sheets can disintegrate faster. That means sea level can rise faster than we predicted. And we're now, you know, a decade ago, the IPCC was being very conservative. They said, well, we don't know how to model those things, so we're going to leave them out. And we think maybe we'll see a foot or two of sea level rise by the end of the century. Well, now, latest IPCC report, we're not talking feet, we're talking meters of sea level rise by 2100, and we can't rule out more. 
that's the direction that the science has moved. And that's a reason for concern. Another reason for concern is that melting is happening earlier, that fresh water is running into the North Atlantic earlier than we expected. And it's capping the sinking of dense, salty, cold water that drives what we call the conveyor belt, the ocean conveyor belt, the thermohaline circulation it's sometimes called, or the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. It's this warm current we sometimes equate it with the Gulf Stream, but it's more than the Gulf Stream. And it heads off in the North Atlantic and it warms you know, parts of Iceland and parts of Europe. Um, and if it collapses, then some of those regions won't warm as fast. Iceland could actually cool. You don't get another ice age. It's not like the movie The Day After Tomorrow, which was a caricature of what I'm talking about. But what we're finding is that you could see a, a, a dramatic decrease in sort of mixing of waters in the North Atlantic, which is one of the most productive natural fisheries in the world. And so we could see uh, devastating impacts on fish populations. Obviously that has implications for us where you know 25% of the world's primary protein source is, is seafood. Um, and it turns out for physics that Milton and I could geek out on, but I'm not gonna go into here. Um, when that current slows down, it turns out that affects the east-west pressure gradient across the Atlantic Ocean in such a way that sea level comes up even more along the east coast of the U.S. So we could get as much as an extra foot of sea level rise along the U.S. east coast above and beyond what we would have predicted from the melting of ice and the expansion of warming seawater. This is happening. And my... Uh, own work, and um, about uh, six years ago, I co-authored an article um, in one of the nature journals um, arguing that we were already seeing the slowdown of this ocean circulation pattern ahead of schedule. And now there have been a number of studies. In fact, there's a region in the North Atlantic that the latest IPCC report now shows is cooling. The rest of the planet's warming up. It's warming up dramatically, but there's this patch, patch of ocean south of Greenland in the North Atlantic which has seen some of its coldest years in recent years. There's this blue cooling patch that when you look at the, the plots, the warm plots of warming, you get these cold blue patch uh, in the North Atlantic. That appears to be the signature of the slowing down of this ocean circulation pattern happening earlier than scheduled. Some of my own research also argues that some of the ways that climate change is increasing extreme weather events aren't well captured in the climate models that are used, for example, in the IPCC projections. In particular, the way the jet stream sort of slows down and gets stuck into these wildly undulating patterns that give us those heat domes in the Western US. And by the way, back East where we are, you know, in Pennsylvania, um, a very persistent trough, the, the flip side of that ridge, the high pressure heat dome in the West is this low pressure or trough in the East that has given us all this rainfall. Uh, some of what we're getting here in Pennsylvania right now is from a tropical storm, the remnants of a tropical storm, but it's been very wet in many of these summers. At the same time, it's been so hot and dry out west. And we have shown that there are some mechanisms by which um, climate change influences the jet stream, the mathematics of which are involved enough that you end up drawing upon some of the same math wave uh, uh, physics and mathematics that was developed to solve problems in quantum mechanics in the early uh, 1900s to solve this problem uh, instead about the behavior of the atmosphere at the very large scale, not at the behavior of matter at the very small scale. Um, and the models are run at a resolution where they don't quite capture some of this physics. And so we think they understate the impacts. And we think we've actually shown that a number of the extreme events, including that heat dome, that heat dome out west, the Pacific Northwest heat dome, the climate model attribution studies said it was a one in 40,000 year event without climate change. But then they said, but we estimate it's still a thousand year event with climate change. Even when they incorporated climate change, it shouldn't happen more often than once in a thousand years. We think that's because the models that they are using for those attribution exercises aren't capturing some of this physics. And some of this physics appears to have been implicated in that very stable. Um, uh, ridge, that uh, that heat dome, and, and many of the other extreme weather events we've seen in recent summers are associated with sort of a stuck, very wavy jet stream, and uh, the models aren't capturing that completely. So the bottom line, the models are conservative. Um, we're, we're due for surprises, and they're not going to be welcome surprises, and uncertainty 
is absolutely not a reason for inaction. Um, it, it's a reason for taking even greater action, a point that I made with a co-author in a piece that appeared, a letter to the editor that appeared in today's Wall Street Journal. It was replying to a, an op-ed, a climate change denying op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal, part of the Murdoch media empires, promoted climate denialism. Um, and, and we pointed out that uh, the fallacy of that op-ed was that it was arguing that uncertainty is a reason for inaction, when in fact it's a reason to take even greater action for all the reasons we've just talked about. And we quoted uh, Dirty Harry, um, you know, do you feel lucky is perhaps the operative question here. Uh, do, do we feel lucky gambling with the entire planet? McManus and Heather Phipps, um, who are asking about uh, things that might be very encouraging, like uh, COP26, for one thing, that's an international uh, meeting, Yep. And secondly, the reconciliation bill, uh, what, what can we hope for in terms of climate change activism? Yeah, it's great. I mean, thanks for the, that question. Uh, we have to keep the pressure on. Uh, right now, there aren't 50 Democrats. It's going to have to pass with 50 Democratic votes and a tie-breaking vote by um, Vice President Kamala Harris. There aren't going to be any Republican votes. Um, and there are two, as you probably know, holdouts right now or possible holdouts. Um, Cole State uh, Democrat uh, Mansion of uh, West Virginia and uh, and Cinema of uh, Arizona. We're going to need 50 votes, um, and maybe they won't get 50 votes for 3.5 trillion. Um, but if we can get 50 votes for a two trillion dollar package that has meaningful climate, and the, you know Republicans would really like to see the climate stuff stripped out because they're basically still acting as advocates for the fossil fuel industry, and they've targeted. Democrats like Manchin. We know that. Um, in fact, there, there was a, uh, I, I briefly in my presentation at the very beginning talked about there was a whistleblower, or not a whistleblower, it was a secretly recorded conversation with an ex, uh, um, Exxon Mobil lobbyist who basically admitted that they were purposely lying about the science and that they were targeting Democrats like Joe Manchin to potentially block any meaningful uh, climate legislation. So there has to be huge grassroots support, demonstrations, um, and everything we can do to put pressure on those, really it's almost coming down to two Democrats to, to, to support, because that's the only way we're going to get climate legislation within the next two years. That's the only way that the Biden administration can make good on its obligations. And even with the Biden administration, you've got to put some pressure on them. They're feeling the pressure from the lobbyists, from the fossil fuel industry. There's some triangulation there. And we're still seeing the approval of pipelines, new pipelines, gas and oil pipelines, at a time when, as I said, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, no friend in the past to the Renewable Energy Agency, has said there can be no new fossil fuel infrastructure. So there's that implementation gap, the gap between the, commit, the commitments, the pledges that politicians are making and the actions. And so we've still got to keep pressure on the Biden administration. Even those we might think of as our friends still need to feel the pressure because otherwise they give way to you know, the immense pressure from the other side. This is from Jamie Northrup. In your opinion, what is the end game of the people or organization that use the Ds that you described, delay and so forth, why do they do it? Down to uh, corporates, corporations have no conscience. Um, I'm sorry, Mitt Romney, um, corporations aren't people. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that in the end, there's no, there's no ethical, there's no core of ethics or morality in a, in a corporation. It seeks to maximize uh, shareholder profits. And, and often you could say, well, but it's individuals who are in positions of leadership. And there are some who are enlightened, who recognize, you know, they have children and, and they want to preserve the planet for them. But there are too many who still very narrowly see their role as to maximize corporate profits at the expense of, well, the planet, right? Um, so in the end, that, that's, that's the problem. And we have a system by which they can corrupt our politics to prevent 
um, any policies that will interfere with their agenda. And that's been the history, of course, in this country for decades, tobacco industry, pharmaceutical industry, you name it. Any time the findings of science have found themselves uh, you know, have, have, uh, on a collision course with the you know, the profit motives of powerful corporations, those corporations have done everything they can to attack the science, to undermine public faith in the science and to block any action. And again, that's where grassroots activism comes in. It's so important. We really see in the Biden administration, much of what they have done and have been willing to do is a result of the immense pressure that was put on them by climate advocates um, who, uh, who really sent a very clear signal um, to the Democratic Party and including Joe Biden, that there was an expectation. We came out, we voted for you. Now we expect you to make good on your commitments to act on climate. And we have to see through, um, we, ha we have to make sure that, um, that, they, they, that the Biden administration does see through to, to meet its um, commitments. And that's where, again, we have to continue to use our voice in every way possible. And that's where I want to you know, again, give a shout out for Extinction Rebellion because you guys have been so effective at doing that, at, ex at exerting pressure um, on politicians to, 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 you know, to act on our behalf rather than to be rubber stamps for special interests and polluters. Well, <laughs> on behalf of everyone who's here, uh, I, I wanna thank you so much because this was both stimulating and encouraging, even though somewhat frightening. Uh, but that's the nature of the problem that we're trying to deal with. And uh, applause to all of the Extinction Rebellion people who are here. Keep up the struggle. I'm Michael E. Mann at Twitter. So feel free to engage with me there as well. And we can get at some of those questions. Okay, so thank you very much. And I, I think I'm passing the baton to Yulia or Jennifer. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Milton. Thank you to Michael Mann for his lifelong and tireless work in the climate space, consistently telling the truth and standing up to some really powerful forces with a, a consistent, solid voice. It, it's so recognized, so important. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone who took time out of busy days to hear some really difficult information. A lot of it I'm sure many of us are, are familiar with, and that may be in fact why you're here today. For those of us where a lot of this very detailed information and explanation connecting a lot of it into a cohesive uh, story telling us what the challenges are in this climate space, if some of this was new to you, you know, you may be sitting there a little bit uh, disheartened, but you know, the point of what Extinction Rebellion is doing is to create a place of active hope. Uh, you know, so there, Michael is a scientist and many of us who are on the call, I do actually recognize a few scientists though, we're not. And there needs to be a place for every voice to be a part of this collective movement addressing climate crisis, addressing our ecological emergency. And I wholly believe that there is a place for every voice and that what Extinction Rebellion is doing uh, with nonviolent direct action is so warranted at this time, this place. I personally have been an activist my entire life uh, my adult life, very propelled initially by the loss of our biodiversity and um, the losing of 150 species daily. And so it really has kept me going, you know, in the fight, staying in the fight. And um, I have hope that we can still change things. And I think that's really important to remember, which, you know, Michael referenced quite a few times. He also referenced, though, that at this time, it's an ethical and a moral obligation to kind of step in in the areas that you can. And I personally think it, it's a real, you know, um, moment of asking ourselves how much courage we have and how much we would be willing to sort of inconvenience ourselves to step into a space like Extinction Rebellion as, as an activist. There are a lot of ways that 
that you can become involved with Extinction Rebellion. And we really like to create a space for every. I know a lot of you are not based in New York, but obviously you can follow us on Instagram or uh, you can actually go to our website, which is xrebellion.nyc. All of these events are always listed there. But for those of you who are based more locally, we would love to encourage you to step out and come meet some of the folks that have been organizing for Extinction Rebellion New York on Sunday, August 22nd. Uh, it should be a really fun event with live music, art build, because one of the things that we're really trying to do is build community and build space for people to talk about some of the complicated emotions that come along with uh, facing down a climate crisis and share that it is a global movement and that thousands of people have stepped into Extinction Rebellion uh, and embraced nonviolent direct action disruption as part of the solution to get forward. And we recognize things that have not worked, um, but we also recognize things that have worked. And so a lot of the design of what we've done, it is an absolute um, hat tip to civil rights activists, to the suffragettes, suffragettes. And so that, you know, we really, follow along that line and that this, in this critical time, it, it warrants that next step. It warrants nonviolent direct action. And so here you can see on the calendar, aside from planning actions, September 17th, which is the last date that you're seeing on your screen, this is the most critical day that we encourage anyone again, who's in the New York tri-state area to sign up. You can sign up on our website and become a part of a mass action, which is kind of kicking off the United Nations summits. Uh, it's going to be a really colorful day, creative disruption. I think we're all recognizing what a pivotal moment this is, what an what a incredible moment it is to be alive, uh, knowing that we have both the challenge and the ability and the luxury to slow down, you know, this beast and to really stand up to it. But it will take everyone, you know, it will take scientists, it will take activists, it will take policy, but they all have their area. And that unified voice that Michael, you know, references, um, we need to have it together and to, to recognize the importance of, of each of us in this area. Stop line three. Thank you for joining tonight. Please, I encourage you to step in again, join on September 17th, and please spread the word about Extinction Rebellion, how folks can be involved in um, NVDA. Once more, thank you to Michael Mann for his brilliant and continuous work. That's thank it. You. Thanks so much.